The M4 chip debuted in the updated iPad Pros earlier this year, so it's been with us for a while, but strangely, we know very little about it, and that's because it's in an iPad. But that being said, we're just a few weeks away from getting our first look at how the M4 series of chips will perform in the Mac, and as of last month, M4 Pro and M4 Max chips are going into production. So this is looking like a very exciting fall, and I wanna break down why that is. And the best way to visualize that is to take a look at how Apple Silicon has gone for the past three generations. Here are the Geekbench 6 multi-core scores of the entire M2 lineup, the entire M3 lineup, and the M4 chip. And straight away, you'll notice a couple of things. The M3 was actually a pretty significant jump. You can see that the M3 Max scores the same as the M2 Ultra. But what's even more impressive than that is the M4 chip. It is scoring exactly the same as the M2 Pro and the M3 Pro. But hang on, why are the M2 Pro and the M3 Pro the same score? Well, let me rearrange this graph a little bit, sorting by score low to high, and we can get some context. The M3 Pro, M2 Pro, M4, and M2 Max are all scoring about the same, but let's add the core breakdowns in and it becomes a lot more clear. The M2 Pro and Max are both eight performance for efficiency, but the M3 Pro trades two of those performance cores for efficiency for an even six and six. What makes the M4 chip so impressive is it gets the same score with 50% less cores than M3 Pro and half the performance cores of M2 Pro. And keep in mind that this is all in an iPad, which is passively cooled. But how did we get to this point? How did Apple make the M4 chip so powerful? Well, to explain why, we're gonna have to get a little bit nerdy right after a word from today's video sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Encrypt your internet activity, block ads, and prevent malware. One of my favorite uses for Surfshark VPN is getting around price discrimination. Many services use geolocation to change prices based on your area or offer lower prices for first-time customers. With Surfshark, you can get around these restrictions to save money. And with advanced safety features such as double VPN, obfuscated servers, split tunneling, kill switch, and more, you can rest assured that your browsing is secure. Plus, Surfshark boosts your online security and privacy, keeping your browsing data hidden on public Wi-Fi networks and blocking malware from your computer. These features, plus many, many more, work together to secure your online presence. So if you want to learn more, check out the link in the description below. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can make sure you're satisfied with the service. And you can use my code LUKEMIANI to get an additional four months on your order. So check out those links down below. Big thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring. Let's get back to the video. Okay, so what actually makes the M4 chip any different? Well, as Apple talked about, it is running on the second generation three nanometer process or N3E. And this brings a bunch of improvements to performance. The efficiency cores are at 2.88 instead of 2.75 gigahertz. And the performance cores can run up to 4.5 gigahertz instead of 4.05. Apple also switched over to LPDDR5 7500 RAM instead of LPDDR5X. And the reason that they seem to have done that is to get this enormous 120 gigabyte per second bandwidth, which is 15 gigabytes per second faster than M3, and doing all of that while also decreasing the memory response time. And coupled with the pretty exciting new rumor that upcoming M4 Max are finally gonna start with 16 gigabytes of RAM, things are looking pretty good. But now is where things get really, really nerdy. I've been reading into this a lot, and honestly, it's very confusing, so I'm gonna do my best to break it down. And if you want more details, I highly recommend this video by Geekerwan. I'll have that linked down below. It's very in-depth. But basically, what Apple has done here is make the M4 chip at its very basic level process data more quickly. For the second generation in a row, the decoding unit has been widened. It can now decode 10 instructions per clock cycle compared to nine on M3 and eight on the M1 and M2 chips. And on the back end, they've improved the dispatch buffer on the floating point unit to handle more operations in parallel, which increase efficiency. But what the hell does any of that mean? Well, let's think of the CPU like a factory. Now, the factory operates on a clock cycle, which is the amount of time that it takes to do one complete operation of the factory. 
fetching, decoding, executing, and storing data. Now on the front end of the chip, we have the decoder, the foreman in this situation. And that foreman is now a little bit smarter. It can handle 10 instructions instead of nine, and eight before that. And once the foreman has its instructions, it delegates to the back end. It sends those instructions down in entries to the dispatch buffer, or the local managers, if you will. And as you can see, each one of those dispatch buffers on the M4 chip is able to handle more entries than the M3. That means that you're decoding more operations and in turn, more of those entries are able to be dispatched at the same time. That's how Apple increases performance while maintaining efficiency. You have the same number of effectively managers, but they're able to manage more tasks. And it's important to note that these are actual silicon changes. This isn't just running the CPU faster. That's what happened with the M2 chip. It is a very slightly tweaked version of the M1 that uses a bit more power, runs at a higher clock speed, and is able to achieve more performance. So it's a different way of increasing the performance, and that's why this jump is so significant. The M4's single core score is more than 20% higher than the M3 chip, marking the largest jump in Apple Silicon since the original M1. So what this tells us is that in the M4 generation, Apple has taken the improvements of this new process and architecture, and they've used it to boost peak performance. They're not focused on making the chips consume less power, but produce more work. And so when you compare the M4 iPad Pro to the M2 iPad Pro, the multi-core score is 46% higher. That is a significant jump. And when you look at the graphs here, it's even more impressive to see the M4 matching the performance of the M3 Pro and the M2 Max. I think it's quite likely that we could see performance out of an M4 Pro chip that gets quite close to that of the M3 Max and the M2 Ultra. That is absolutely insane. And as for the M4 Max chip, well, I think that that is going to be an absolute monster. Because keep in mind, the M3 Max is able to match the performance of the M2 Ultra despite having four less performance cores and four less efficiency cores. And despite the fact that the M2 Ultra is literally two M2 Max chips glued together. But this is where things get interesting for the M4 generation because the M3 broke with tradition. On the M3 Max chip, Apple silently removed the UltraFusion interconnect. But without that technology, there was no M3 Ultra. So it seems like Apple has a different approach. They skipped the Ultra chip for one generation, but it seems quite likely that the M4 will eventually, if not in October, get an Ultra chip. But what we don't know is if Apple left off the interconnect on the M3 Max because they knew they were going to skip that generation, or if it's because they're developing a new technology to make an Ultra chip without having to glue two Max chips together. So this is something that I'm going to be keeping my eye on very closely when the M4 Max comes out. Will it have the interconnect or not? And of course, if you want to see how those chips perform as well as find out whether there's an interconnect board, make sure to hit that subscribe button because I'm going to be covering all of this. Now, as for whether there will be an Ultra chip at all, Mark Gurman seems to think there will. He says that they're planning three main versions, including the base M4 and higher end versions, codenamed Brava, that will replace M3 Pro and Max, and an M4 Ultra dubbed Hydra. But while the M4 chip brings a bunch of big changes to the CPU core architecture, the GPU, mm, not so much. Basically what Apple has done with the M4 GPU is what they did with the M2 chip a couple generations ago. It's got about a 10% higher clock speed, which means it consumes about 10% more power and produces about 10% higher benchmarks. It's effectively the same GPU with ray tracing that was introduced for the M3 generation, but running a little bit faster. And this is likely possible thanks to better binning now that those GPUs have been in production for a while. As for what this means for the Pro or Max chips, well, I could see Apple increasing the core counts. You'll notice that the M3 Pro comes in 14 or 18 GPU core configurations. To me, this screams binning issue, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see that jump to 16 and 20 GPU cores. 
So with all of this in mind, in just a few weeks to go until what is likely going to be Apple's Mac-focused October event, what can we actually expect? Well, the number one headliner that I think a lot of people are looking forward to is a redesigned Mac Mini. The Mac Mini design hasn't changed in nearly 15 years, so this is a big one that I am very excited for. Also expected at this event is an M4 iMac as well as M4, M4 Pro, and M4 Max MacBook Pros. But there is a critical gap in these expectations, and that is the Mac Studio, Mac Pro, and MacBook Air. This is all kind of in keeping with Apple's strategy. The MacBook Air is going to be on the latest chip, but not at launch. So give it a couple of months, maybe spring of next year, and you'll probably be able to get your hands on an M4 MacBook Air. And of course, the Mac Studio and Mac Pro make sense because they need ultra chips. So in my mind, that is almost certainly going to be WWDC 2025. So we're in a bit of an interesting spot because we're going into a very likely Mac event here in October where we already have the base chip we just don't know how it's going to perform in a Mac but we can also expect Pro and Max chips that will take that to the next level and given how impressive the M4 chip already is I think the Pros and Maxes are going to be absolutely ridiculous to the point that I honestly think most people shouldn't even care about the M4 Ultra because you're just not gonna need it. And certainly if you are a Mac Mini fan, this is gonna be the event for you. Not only are you gonna leapfrog the M3 and go straight to an M4 and hopefully M4 Pro, but we'll also get this new redesign that we've been hearing about and that is going to be super duper exciting. As for the MacBook Pros, I am excited to get my hands on these new chips, but do be aware of one thing and that is the M4 MacBook Pros are going to be coming out at the third anniversary of this new MacBook Pro design. And typically, Apple has kept about a four or five year schedule for their redesigns. The Unibody MacBook Pro came out in 2008. In 2012, the Retina came out in 2016, the Touch Bar. Then we had a slightly longer gap of five years before the Apple Silicon MacBook Pros came out, but I think that was for obvious reasons because of that transition period. So I would expect that next fall or 2026 at the latest, we should see a new generation of MacBook Pros coming out. So if that's important to you, definitely keep that in mind. Me personally, I buy every MacBook Pro ever made because I review them. But if you're a normal human being who buys a computer every three to five years or so, it might be worth checking out the timing on this new generation. But whatever the future holds, I am super excited to see what Apple does with this next generation of silicon. And if you are too, don't forget to smash that subscribe button and leave a like down below. Why did I say smash? What, are, what am I thinking? Anyway, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.